All right. Hey, welcome, guys. Mr. Flores here with Pastor Kevin. I am so excited for this conversation that we're going to have in our pre-conversation. Man, I can just sense his enthusiasm, his love, not only just for the scripture, but for Jesus. And there, there's a lot of amazing stuff that we're going to talk about in this next 20 minutes. Um, so he is the lead pastor at Beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. And interestingly enough, he's doing all these pre-recordings because he's down in Texas right now. He took the call to come on up here to Portland and pastor this church, and he'll be up here with his wife in January, or she'll move shortly after January, but he'll definitely be up here in January. So we might even see him on campus, hopefully if things get back to normal um, in one of our chapels, uh, just talking to him just this little brief time. I know you guys are going to love him. So um, we're going we're gonna to jump right into it. Um, Pastor Kevin, I'd love it if you could just uh, share real quick, like, what do you think the big idea is for Matthew chapter six, the big idea? So uh, the, the biggest idea here, uh, it, it's a little, little more expansive there, um, is, is first to understand that chapter six, what Jesus is talking about with these people is in the context of what they're experiencing. And so to just give you a super baseline of that, um, what these people are used to is their priests, their, the, the Pharisees, teachers of the law, would just go off. Um, they, they would, their goal was for you to look at them and think, how awesome are they? Uh, and that, that's why they pray forever. That's why they would make these big, loud, like, oh, thank you, God, that I'm not as bad as that jerk in the back. Uh, th they would just focus themselves on themselves. And that's what their prayers were about. That's what their actions were all about. And so what Jesus is trying to help people see is it's not about how you look. It's about why you're doing what you're doing, kind of that internal motivation. You're following Jesus because you're following Jesus, not for anything else. Because um, as Jesus goes a little further in um, and he talks about the treasures that we're storing up for ourselves, um, what you're doing isn't earning you anything more because everything that you needed was earned for you on the cross. Everything was earned for, for you through what Jesus is about to go do. Um, and he's just trying to give them a future look into the motivation behind why you should do what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, I think that motivation for what you're doing and why you're doing it is, in, is so important. I, I read this book years ago. It says, start with why. And I almost feel like mm -hmm. this section of, of Matthew's gospel is that whole start with why. This is why you're doing what you're doing. Because even in the pre-conversation, I, I said, it sometimes feels like Jesus is being harsh with us. Like when he says, you have little faith, and we might get to that a little bit later. But I really liked how you said he's talking about our practical days, you know, for the people back then specifically, but it still has something to do with us. So maybe we could unpack some of those practical things because some students had some questions um, about this. So one of the first questions is, you know, what, what does it mean when it says store your treasures up in heaven, you know, where moth and rust, you know, don't corrupt, you know, what, what's that all about? What is Jesus doing there? Yeah. So that's actually tying right back into to that main focus there. Yeah. Um, you're not literally stare, storing treasures up. It's not like, here's your checklist and here's what everything's worth. Like it, it's not an achievement you're unlocking or anything. When he's talking about storing your treasures in heaven, um, he's calling you to put your focus on what he has given to you, that gift of grace that we have, that promise, that hope of an eternal salvation with Jesus. Um, and, and so what he's really telling you to do there is it's not about storing treasures in heaven so much as it is don't allow your worldly possessions, your, your material things, you know, your money, your car, your house, uh, you know, what kind of shoes you wear, um, really anything, your followers, they aren't what define you. Um, your identity is in Christ. And so the treasure that we have in heaven is an eternity with him that is coming either when he calls you home or when he comes back. Um, and so it's more so about don't, don't allow yourself to be shortchanged by what this world can offer. Um, because he even goes in a little deeper into saying that those who, who you know, seek, seek treasures here on earth, you know, they're going to get the reward, which is you get to enjoy what's here. But what's here is only temporary. That's where it goes into the where, where moth and rust destroy. Um, because in heaven, nothing can take that from you. Nothing can remove that from you. Nothing can impact you in a negative way. Because in heaven, everything is perfect. And so the treasures that we're storing, um, really, Jesus has already put up there for us. And it's more so just a call to don't allow this world to distract you from what Jesus has called you to do first. 
Gotcha. So you kind of touched on a couple of things that I think it almost feels as if you're stepping on our toes or it almost feels as if Jesus is stepping on the things that I really love. And, and so maybe I could ask you, what is something you really love that's a possession that maybe in your life you had to wrestle with and be like, I don't know, is that something that I should continue investing in? Or, you know, cause I think a lot of our students, um, I'm thinking some of our, a lot of our boy students, they collect these shoes and they have these, um, man, there is a massive investment in shoes. And I, I don't know, it's convincing every time I see the shoes that they wear, they're sweet, they're awesome, they look cool. So is Jesus asking us to give up stuff like that or, or what do you think is going on there quite, quite practically? Oh, that's a, that's a great question because there's kind of a fine line there. Um, does Jesus want us to enjoy what, what he's given us on this earth? Most definitely, you know, buy your shoes, buy your video games, you know, have the super fancy dinners at the super fancy restaurants. Um, I know it was a few years ago, I'm 29 now, um, but when I was in high school, the big thing was how expensive of a dinner can I buy the girl I'm taking out? Um, you know, because I want to show her I can take care of her there. Uh, but I mean, what can I do to make people look at me? That's where you kind of get into crossing the line. Um, do, does God want you to enjoy the blessings of this earth? Yeah, most definitely. And right now that's in technology, that's in shoes, that's in clothes, that's in, in, in a lot of things. And, and so enjoy that. But as soon as that becomes your primary focus, mm. that becomes your main goal in life to, to make sure I can get that pair of shoes because that, that'll bring attention back to me. Mm. Um, that's where you've crossed into the realm of what Jesus is talking about here. Right. You're putting the focus on yourself, on what you have here. Um, and and it's, it's kind of a hard thing to, to focus on. Um, really, the closest thing I have is that dinner thing. I was trying to think, man, right now, what do I really struggle with? Um, I, I guess the biggest thing for me is money. And it's not because I want to have a lot of it so people see me. Uh, it's because, and I have no idea, uh, wh what happens if my air conditioner blows up? And I know up in Portland, you don't all have air conditioning. Uh, but down in Texas, we most definitely do. And if that ever goes out, that would be almost like a death sentence. Uh, but at the same time, if money becomes my focus, God tends to let me struggle a little bit more with it. Um, and, and it's when we get back to trusting in him that, you know, he's, he's going to give you an opportunity to get that next pair of shoes, to get that next dress, to, to get what you want in this world. Um, not necessarily to let you be the richest person in the world, but to allow you to enjoy the playground he's really given us to play in, right. um, while still recognizing he's the one who got it for you. He's yeah. the one who lets you get to that. And he doesn't want that to be your focus. If that becomes your God, then it becomes a problem. Right. And I'm probably going to botch it, but uh, if, if you're a C.S. Lewis fan or if there are any sophomores that are listening right now that are a C.S. Lewis fan, he said something like, if you aim for earth, you're not going to get either heaven or earth. But if you aim for heaven, you're going to get earth thrown in. And, and when you said that the earth is kind of like this playground or play box, I, I, I love that imagery because I think sometimes we can view our possessions as, well, I, I really shouldn't have that nice thing if I'm going to be a Christ follower. And I'm not so certain Jesus ever thought that way. Um, he had many disciples even and Paul knew many rich people who were supporting him and it's not like you know every single person is called to sell everything they have and just give it away completely but would you say that with shoes for example so kids that like you know are known more for their shoes than they are about Jesus is that the fine line that you're talking about there yes um but but having it isn't what causes you to cross the line it's what is your goal in that? Um, because having the super nice shoes, having the super nice car, um, for, for example, we have these mega church pastors all over the place. Uh, personal favorite of mine, uh, I live five miles down the road from Joel Osteen, but I'm a huge Stephen Furtick fan. I love him. Um, I, I love what he brings in his messages. Yeah. Um, I also love, you know, his style. You know, yeah. he doesn't wear flamingos up there, but <laughs> I, I, I can't pull off what he's wearing. Uh, but at the same time, his money, his, his you know, bravado, his everything about him um, attracts people to him. And he uses that as an opportunity to share Jesus with as many people as he can reach. Right. And so I, I would challenge you, I mean, even as a, as a sophomore in high school with the coolest shoes in school, yeah. are you using that to promote yourself? Are you using that as an opportunity to show people, yeah, I have cool shoes and I follow Jesus. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I, I try to communicate to them when we go through such a passage like this. Um, 
I, I can't agree more with you there. Um, there's this funny and it's, it's very satirical, but I don't know if you've seen it on Instagram. It's like preacher sneakers. Have you seen this uh, Instagram? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> the person that started it must have been very disgruntled. Um, didn't have the positive outlook on possessions like you do. Um, because I, it seems as if they, they take these photos of these famous preachers, but then zoom in on what they're wearing, and then they put a price tag next to it. <laughs> and I'm like, geez, like someone has taken like a detailed magnifying glass into other people's potential issues. And I think Jesus had something to say about that too, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's planks and logs and stuff, but. Uh. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I love your positive outlook on the possessions, but also aligning it with the purpose and kingdom of God. I hope our students can take something away from that question there. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Um, okay. So uh, another question that came up that I thought was interesting is what, what is wrong with prayers being too long? And if you just want to talk to God, it was a couple of students actually asked that one. That is, uh, that is such a beautiful question. Um, because when we're reading scripture, uh, th that's why it's just so important to, to try to read it in the context of everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. And so going back to the main idea, Jesus is trying to point out that what you've seen a faithful follower of God do um, is not necessarily right. And so what, what they believe to be faithful is they watch these Pharisees who, again, just go up in front of everybody and loudly are saying, God, thank you so much. I'm not like these people behind me. Um, it was all about them. It was a show. And so when Jesus is saying, uh, I actually think it's in verse seven here. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. He's not saying you can't have long prayers. What he's saying is if you're praying a long time so that everyone around you thinks you're super cool, mm -hmm. that's the problem. It again goes back to your motivations. Man, if you spend literally every second of a 24-hour day praying to God, that's that's awesome. That's such a cool way for you to connect with God and actually a super interesting challenge. Can we go 24 hours where our entire wow. mindset is on talking to God? Could you do that? Um, but it, it all comes down to if you want to talk to God, talk to God. Right. If you're doing it so people around you think you're cool, that's the, that's the problem. And that's what Jesus is warning against. So no, if you want to talk to God, pray, babble on, let him, let him hear what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Cause elsewhere, I feel like sometimes students read a, a passage of scripture like this, or maybe a critic of scripture reads this and they say, well, clearly Jesus and Paul never really had a conversation because Paul said, pray without ceasing, which your challenge kind of goes more with what Paul is saying rather than Jesus. But I think you use, use this word motivation. What is your motivation behind it? Because these disciples had grown up in a culture and we're so shaped by a culture, right? I mean, every single person is shaped by their culture. And so what they were used to is looking at these Pharisees and that's just what they thought they were supposed to do. And so it's almost like this snowball with a rock to the face paradigm shift where Jesus is saying, this is what you've grown up with, but let me tell you how, what it's really like. And so he said, don't be like them. So yeah, that motivation thing, I think is huge. And they just didn't have the best examples with the Pharisees because they were really pushing people away. So what do you think about religious leaders that do it for show? And how do we know who is doing it for show? And should we be cautious or be aware of such preachers who are doing it for show? Most definitely. Um, and, and where that comes down to is making sure anything you hear, um, you're, you're checking it up against the word of God. You're, you're pulling it back to, well, what did, what did he mean by that? If a, if a preacher or a teacher or anyone um, throws a verse at you, yeah. go read it in the context of what it was actually being shared with. Because um, so often it's pulled out. Um, now, there may be some preachers who are doing it for show. Um, and, and something that we got to remember there is, even though they may be doing it for show, hmm. the word of God is still present there. So, so you're still hearing some pretty powerful things. Um, and something also to remember there is in the end, God knows their heart. Um, that's not for us to judge. It's not for us to say, you're doing that for show. Uh, I, I fall into that because, uh, you know, I'm a pastor. I'm a young guy. And I, I watch some of these, you know, Gen Xer and baby boomer pastors out there and think, you all have no idea what you're doing. Um, and and, and that's, that's on me. That's my sin. That, that's I have to seek forgiveness for that uh, because that, that's me judging them. Because I'm like, you're doing this because you've always, you always have. It's, it's for you. It's not for the people. Yeah. But 
you know, e even in then, grace is for me, grace is for them. It's not my job to judge them. And as far as they know, that may be what they know to be best. Because yeah. we always give the Pharisees kind of a hard rap because um, they should have known better. You're right. Um, but God tells us they'll be judged more harshly uh, for, for misleading. And so in the same way, these preachers, you should always be cautious of anyone who tells you anything um, and always check it against the source, which is the word of God. But at the same time, if you check it and you find out they're wrong, um, your job is not to blow them up about it. You can bring it to their attention and say, hey, I just checked up on something you said and I'm, help me understand what you're saying here. Um, and, and be able to, to have that conversation. But our culture is going to tell you, nope, you should put them on blast. You should throw it out on Instagram, throw it out on Snapchat, and let everybody in the world know um, what an idiot this pastor is. When in actuality, what Jesus is telling you is, no, if you find someone who's wrong, go to them one-on-one. -on -one. And if they won't listen, bring a brother. And if they won't listen, bring an elder. And just continue to go and try to seek reconciliation first. So yes, be cautious. Yeah. But if you find someone to be false, um, you know, separate yourself from them and, and see if you can bring it to their attention. But if not, it's not your place to judge them. Let God be the judge. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, in our context up here, and maybe it's true there, it, it can, like you're saying, it can be so easy to look at somebody and just judge them immediately. I'm not too familiar with that pastor you men mentioned, other than I've seen him a couple of different times. Uh, St Stephen, Fur you said Furtick? Yes, sir. And then you, you said you live like five minutes from Joel Osteen as well. Yeah. And I feel like Joel Osteen is like, it's from people that I know in here, it's, they just like, he's just a big target, you know, and I feel bad for the guy. I've, um, I've only heard him once ever before. And it was interesting because I heard him share the gospel. And then at the end of the message, I heard him invite not just everybody there, but all his listeners, he said, now go find a good Bible believing church and get plugged in. I was like, whoa, that's like different than what I hear other people saying about him. And I feel like we can often get caught in the rabbit trail of what other people are saying, rather than kind of going to the source and what you're, and, and so my context is far removed from Joel Osteen. I'll, I'll probably never have that conversation with him. Hey, I heard you say this wrong thing because I'm up here in Portland. This is my context. This is my mission field up here. But I do find it interesting how people can quickly um, just start to be so negative in their critique of others without really knowing them, without being involved in their own situation or anything like that. So I really liked how you encouraged us there. Thank you. Um, let's see, another another question here, in which I thought was funny. Why, and it kind of goes back maybe full circle and we're kind of coming to the end. We have about two and a half minutes left here. Why shouldn't we worry about what we eat and what we wear? If we didn't care, we would we would have dirty clothes and always eat unhealthy food. <laughs> it's like, I love the way my students ask questions. It's so cool. Oh yeah. And, and that's, that's a totally fair question. And again, um, when we read this in our own context, that makes total sense. So let me be first to say, you are more than welcome to care about the clothes you put on your body, make sure they've been washed and the food that you're eating, you know, don't eat, don't eat garbage all the time. Yeah. Um, so you can focus on there, but the context that Jesus is talking about here really comes down, uh, to, to, to verse 27 here. And he does a great job. I would encourage you to read all of 25 through the end of chapter six, but in verse 27, where it says, can any one of you, um, by worrying add a single hour to your life, the point of what he's saying here is, are you able to control the world around you? Mm. And, and, and if by controlling it, um, would you be able to add anything to your life? Um, so you're talking about shoes and um, shoes and food and such. Like right now, can you really control where your, your clothes and, and where your uh, food is coming from? Maybe to a point, you know, if you have a job, you're able to buy some stuff for you, but predominantly your parents are probably providing that for you. Right. Um, as you get older, you may have to take care of that yourself. But even in that instance, what Jesus is telling us is put our focus on the one who, who takes care of the birds of the air and of the, the grass of the field. Um, allow God to be God. Uh, th there's a phrase I heard throughout seminary, and I continue to hear it now. Um, God is God and you are not. Mm -hmm. And so what Jesus is trying to help us see here is, are your concerns valid? Most definitely. All right. Sometimes it's scary. Where's my next meal coming from? Mm -hmm. um, think about right now. Probably a lot of you are, are, are doing some classes online, or you're only able to come in and see a few friends at a time. You can't control COVID, but God can. You can't control how online class works, but, but God can. 
uh, through your teachers, through the tech people. But um, Jesus is, is just trying to help people see, are your concerns valid? Most definitely. There's some scary things in this world. But let my father in heaven be the creator he's always been. Right. Let God be God and accept that we may not be able to control it. Mm. So what can we control? Well, we can control our attitude. We can control how we use the blessings God has given us in order to expand his kingdom. And we can control how we encourage and uplift others who may be struggling because they got sucked a little further down in the rabbit hole. Because when we worry, that's just Satan at work trying to distract you from the God who made you and has an incredible plan for your life. Yeah, man. Amen on that point um, about control. I love what you said. Uh, God is God and you are not. And, you know, there, there's so much that is out of our control. Um, the state of our country, political upheaval, racial tensions, like there's so much that's out of our control. And sure, we can contribute where we can. Um, but it seems as if Jesus' prayer then has just as much meaning for us today. He says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you know, and it's, it's God who is behind all of that. And I, I think what you taught me, and I hope what a lot of the sophomores have heard, is God is, like you're saying, in control of these situations. Yes, there are things that we wrestle with, struggle with, and there are things that Jesus challenges us with here. Um, but as long as we can go back and have that center piece on your will be done, your kingdom come, your will be done, that mindset, he wants that to happen here. So it's not like we're supposed to have a detached relationship with our physical goods either. Um, but man, I, I do think so much is out of our control. God, I think, is challenging us. Hey, where's the faith during this time? You know, and um, thank you so much, Pastor Kevin. Are there any last thoughts? We're coming to the end. We're at 22 minutes here. Final words of encouragement, exhortation to students who are studying the book of Matthew and learning what it is to follow Jesus. Um, I, I, I really just think verse 24, uh, or 24, verse 34, in, in light of what you just said, especially, uh, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Mm. Um, keep your focus on what God's calling you to right here, right now. Yeah. Like, there's a time for future planning. There's a time for getting ready for what's coming. Um, and that's more than appropriate. But make sure that first, what you're seeking is the kingdom of God and what he has planned for you. And when it comes to the political world, um, we're, we're going to have different opinions. Probably you have a different opinion from me, uh, and, and that's okay. What's more important is how you treat people with a different opinion rather than who you voted for. Yeah. Um, and so just keep your focus on, um, you know, how are we all together fitting into the good that God is working for? Because whether Trump, Biden, or someone else wins, mm -hmm. God's still working for good in all things. So don't worry about what's coming. Put your focus on what God's called you to today and let him be the one who leads you in using all the blessings he's given you uh, in order to expand his kingdom through you. Amen. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, Pastor Kevin. We'll hopefully see you again soon, man. Sounds good. Thank you.